This episode is brought to you by Sketchy Audio. As an amateur podcaster, you probably think the sound quality on your podcast is poor, as bad as it can be. But how do you know? It could be worse, of course. And Sketchy Audio are the experts who can guarantee that it is. When you upload your recording disaster to their malware-injecting FTP site, they'll carefully analyze it for production mistakes you may have missed. And then they'll edit them right in. Pops, clicking, stutters, dropouts, distortion, hiss, rumbles, buzzing, weird background noises like creaking chairs or farts. They do it all at Sketchy Audio. You need to sound like you're talking at your mic from the bottom of Buffalo Bill's well in Silence of the Lambs? That all comes standard at Sketchy Audio. Do you need the volume and gain of different participants to vary from, what do you say, quiet, to, ouch, my ears loud? Done and done. But beware, not every listener is disturbed by the same audio irritants. You need to hit them with a full spectrum attack to be sure that at some point, they'll shudder and whip off their earbuds seconds too late and try to rub hand sterilizer on their eardrums. And when you order with the promo code reread, one word, they'll insert the words, you know, at the beginning and end of every sentence. And thank you, Sketchy Audio, for sponsoring the Rereading Wolf podcast. This episode is brought to you by the support of generous listeners just like you. You can learn how to be one of them at patreon.com slash rereadingwolf. And thank you, listener patrons, for supporting the Rereading Wolf podcast. Warning. The following discussion is deliberately riddled with spoilers and unhinged speculation on this nearly 40-year-old book. Gene Wolfe's The Book of the New Sun. You can't read a Gene Wolfe story. You can only reread a Gene Wolfe story. Welcome to Rereading Wolf. We don't pretend that this is the first time you and we have read these books. We want to understand them in as much detail as possible, and that means considering the works as a whole. Hi, I'm James Wynn. And I'm Craig Brewer. Hi, Craig. Hello on this. Well, nobody else knows that it's Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to say hello on this Wednesday evening, but that means well, it, nothing, nothing to will, anyone. It will be true for some people. That's true. true for some people, yeah. <laughs> so let's see. You know, it looked like we were going to have a correction, but I think in the end, we all came around to agreeing. Oh, heck, let's just play that correction music. Hey, you was wrong. You was wrong. On Reddit... Christopher Taylor said, I thought that the confusion over the word natural would be sorted out after the previous episode, but I'm surprised that it's still persisting. If you wish, I'm tearing my hair out. I'm tugging my earlobes. My legs are falling off. Yeah, I was going to say, if people don't remember, he's the one who is tugging his hair out. No, 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 no. He's not. No, no. He's, oh, he's the, not the one. Oh, this is a new okay, one. Good. This is a new oh, one. This good, is a new good. one. Well, shoot. Then that yeah. means we are one of the causes. Of yeah, well, yeah. Hopefully he's not actually an amputee. I don't know. But <laughs> he says a noctual is a type of bat and noctual is obviously meant to reference noctual. The word noctual, as with the Latin word noctua for owl, is derived from the word nox, meaning night, hence Jonah's explanation of the word. Wolf's motive in using noctual, a somewhat obsolescent term for a brief academic text may be a simple pun. Like nuptials that chase Severian and Jonas, many academic nuptials could be described as flimsy and producing hot air. <laughs> I, I, okay, I will choose not to be resentful. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't be offended. Well, so we batted this around for a while, and I think we ended up all agreeing that nuptial as a slip of paper is appropriate for the creature that chased Severian and Jonas. But the term noctual, well, you know, it's also appropriate since it refers to, you know, a night beast. Literally, that's what it means. And, mm. and Jonas says that they're called them that because they encounter them at night. And for that etymology, noctual doesn't work at all. And Christopher conceded that point and offered an in-world explanation for Jonas's problematic etymology. He says... Were Jonas getting the word wrong, it might reinforce that he's remembering something that happened a long time ago. But if that were the intent, I would think it would need to be less ambiguous what he was supposed to be saying. More like Severian's apparent misunderstanding of husbandry near the beginning of Shadow. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, Craig, the conclusion you and I, and maybe Christopher, came down on is that Wolf really liked 
the Creatures Association with both words, noctual and noctual. Maybe originally it was noctual, but then he liked the paper association and changed the name to noctual, but he kept Jonas's explanation as a tip of the hat to noctual. Mm-hmm. Remember that when Wolf wrote this, he, you know, he probably didn't expect glossaries to be written about the book. But, you know, perhaps this is uh, just a testament to Wolf's love of words. Yeah. And it's, on the one hand, impossible to say what idea he was initially thinking of. And at the same time, I think it's kind of cool that we don't know, because one of the fun things about really unique artists is that their brains may be working on those happy accidents, even when they're not aware of it. Yeah. So that's one reason why I find this so fun, is that it would work if it was a deliberate weird geeky pun and it also works if it's a happy accident because it still fits the whole sense of words changing and meanings of things changing over time and Mm -hmm. yeah it's just it it's such a beautiful little moment because it's so perfectly appropriate whether it was intentional or not to have both of those things there yeah definitely Uh, but anyway as a complete aside uh christopher included an unassociated ninth century story that does, as he promised, sound like a brown book story. Yeah, and this uh, was awesome. Yeah, it's, 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 so an Arab and his hunting retinue comes to a monastery to spend the night. And during that time, the guy's dog dies. It had been a gift from some nobleman. So he accuses the monks of poisoning it. So the monk, Rabin Syriacus, says, well, will you be satisfied if your dog isn't dead? And well, naturally, the guy says, yeah, yeah, sure. And so Rabin Syriacus says, well, it's not dead. It's just asleep. Get on your horses and I'll wake him. So he goes over to the dog and he touches it with his staff and he says, dead dog, get up and die outside of our district. And the dog got up. And as soon as they crossed the border of the country, it dropped dead because it was a zombie dog. (laughs) (laughs) And it's just such a weird thing. That's like, yep, you're fine. It won't be our fault. (laughs) I'm not going to save your dog. (laughs) Yeah. And of course, I guess they're probably too far for him to decide to, you know, (laughs) <laughs> go back to, to use the return policy or anything yeah so. but at the same time he agreed to precisely that yeah the, the yeah. terms of the exactly. thing yeah so i think i remember i said something like so i, I love that story but i have no idea what lesson i'm supposed to learn <laughs> but it's awesome <laughs> anyway check it out on the reddit post for the episode and let's see in the last episode i noted that i see a cosmic hamlet's mill style connection between the white necropolis path in chapter one of shadow and the white path at house absolute i see them both as in a mythical level a higher level like sky over Mythgarther in the wizard knight i i think it's those paths are both the milky way and i think wolf is creating myth in this novel and it doesn't tell me you know, the things I guess that are most important in wolf stories, character motivations, backstories, uh, basically what is happening. But it's pleasing to me to see the architectural engineering that Wolf has built into his stories. Well, in Reddit, tough subject <laughs> sees another connection between chapter 13 of Claw and chapter one of Shadow. In both instances, there's a reference to herb collection going on. The Ulan seems to have been collecting herbs because he has a vasculum and there are herbs actually in it. And Tough Subject says, it seems possible that the lonely Ulan was out gathering herbs, which would recall Drote's physician's gallopots ploy with the volunteers outside the necropolis gate. It's lucky for Severian and Jonas that Cornet uses a nice brass vasculum to collect herbs rather than Drote's length of common string, which wouldn't have been much help disposing of the nodules. I like this, Craig. I don't know what Wolf would have been getting at with the herb collecting theme, but it's obvious to me that he could have chosen something, you know, that would have been more credible, uh, that they could have collected the nodules in, like a bottle with a cork. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it it was a good catch because I just totally hadn't thought of them collecting herbs in the beginning, with or at least talking about the mm-hmm. the using that as an excuse. But it is definitely something that was on Wolf's mind. Yeah, and, and now I'm trying to think. Like I feel like if I had missed that connection, I feel like I must have missed some other place where that comes up. <laughs> I can't I can't remember. I'm like, well, now, did the yeah. Pellerines later on talk about collecting <laughs> things? I don't know, but I'm going to be on yeah, the lookout I'll, for I'll, it. Yeah, I'll be on my lookout for for anybody collecting anything, any kind of spices, herbs, herb garden, whatever. 
Martha Stewart. <laughs> On Reddit, Ouroboric Quest has a theory regarding the controversial guilt or innocence of Morwenna. Briefly, he, assuming it's a he, thinks Morwenna was innocent of killing her family, but did kill Eusebia in the way the Severian summarized. It's interesting to me, as this entire debate is interesting to me. And so thank you, Aurora Boraquest. And the link is posted in the show notes. So check it out. And just because he mentioned Merwinna, I want to bring up now that you are recently reading Joe Walton's book, among others. Mm -hmm. um, and we were talking about that and I'd read it a while back, but the main character of that book's name is Morwenna as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, which yes. I had totally forgotten until you brought it up. And so I was spending a little time this afternoon trying to see if anyone had made anything of that connection. And unless I'm really bad at Google, I don't think <laughs> anyone has written anything. But even though Wolf doesn't appear in that novel, which sort of famously he had lists a whole bunch of other books. Yeah, what is with reading. that? There was no Wolf. Uh, that was my biggest disappointment because, it, I mean, look, it takes place before the publication of uh, the of book New of the New Sun. Yeah. But there's lots of short stories, and she talks about a lot of authors. And Mainly she actually were hard sci-fi people. So, but I don't know. But even at that point, I mean, Wolf. There's was, some fantasy. There's some. There's fantasy. some. There's some. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she makes a lot of Tolkien for sure. Yeah, that's true. And and Fifth you know, was Yeah, around, and, so. and what was I was really hopeful when she goes to a store and she picks up a copy of Isaac Asimov's uh, science fiction magazine, because even though it happens in January of 1980, which she actually does that. Mm -hmm. uh, she was surprised to see it. She'd never seen it in this store before. And Wolf had a story in December of 79 and in February of 1980. So hmm. there's a lot of opportunity for her to have encountered Wolf. <laughs> it doesn't have to have been the January episode. In fact, it probably would have been like the February issue anyway. That's awesome. That's awesome. The only other thing too, this is totally random, but just speaking of things that we're reading, I'm decided to reread Samuel Delaney's Never Yon, Never Yon, Never Yon, Never Yona. He says how to pronounce it, and I still can't get my head right. But Never Yon, the tales from Never Yon, the Never, right, the end never book stories. stories, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> but which is kind of fun because it's certain. I mean, we're spending all this time talking about something that's kind of happening at the end of history, and those books are all about a Conan type world, but right on the very beginning of history where writing is getting started and, and the basics of sort of economic rules are getting started. And it just kind of was fun. We're like two of these extreme history kind of moments, but, but really connected to history too. Kind of cool. So if you're looking for something on the opposite end of the new sun spectrum, that might be a fun one to take a look at. Yeah, def. You keep the crooks and charlatans and business babe. We have new patrons to thank. First, thank you to our new Journeyman sponsors, Combiner and Joseph. Remember that the Journeyman level of $2 a month will get you access to all the extra content on Patreon, which right now is a bunch of episodes about Jorge Luis Borges, as well as James' new project of recording his thoughts on his first read of Land Across, chapter by chapter. We also have three new master level patrons. And remember at that level, $5 a month gets you some fun extra bonuses like stickers, the logo, art from some of our fascinating artist friends, and as you've already heard in these comments, your own audio tag when you comment. This episode, you've already heard one from a new person already, Christopher Taylor. Welcome Fred Kish. And Kyle Bracken. Thank you all so much for the support. It goes back into paying our hosting fees. We're working on some sound consistency upgrades as well as other things like maybe a transcription service as well, which would be really useful. So we promise we're not just saving up for first editions and full of society books. Yeah, well, you know, otherwise we're a little light on listener responses this week. So I'll yield you back your time. And we'll move right on to a tour of the Garden of House Absolute, which makes me think of Severian as Alice and, you know, encountering the Red Queen and also that peculiar garden art that Aniri has filled it with. And I mean, these ain't your typical garden gnomes. <laughs> Chapter 14, The Antechamber. Don't get excited at the title, yeah. everybody. Wolf Ooh. is a liar. 
<laughs> yeah, this is a wolf title, and as such, Severian is not going to actually enter the Antrid Chamber until the very end. And the title is the only signal we're going to get that that's where he is, right? Yeah, yeah. This chapter two is one of those kind of transitional chapters, like we talked about, mm-hmm. where not a whole lot happens, but this one does a whole lot more because it's still incredibly strange. Like there's all kinds of little moments and set pieces that raise all kinds of questions and just make everything about house absolute seem mysterious and, and weird. And it's, it's really cool. So yeah, we're not, we're going to have a whole lot of suggestions of things this time probably, but uh, not as much plot. Uh, We start though with an epilogue. We left the last chapter with a cliffhanger. Here we are still at Thursday or Friday of the second week since Severian left the tower. And Severian is running to some white shape in the distance with Jonas telling him that he's an idiot. All pretty typical for this book so far. And we're going to read a lot of the first part here just because it's it's really cool. (laughs) It's really good. So there are beings and artifacts against which we batter our intelligence raw. And in the end, make peace with reality only by saying it was an apparition, a thing of beauty and horror. Yeah, that's pretty much this book, right? I was going to say, that's how (laughs) I think a lot of people end up, like, after you bang your head against these books so long, that's kind of how you feel. Which is not bad, but anyway. um, Somewhere among the swirling worlds I am so soon to explore, there lives a race like and yet unlike the human. They are no taller than we are. Their bodies are like ours, save that they are perfect, and that the standard to which they adhere is wholly alien to us. Like us, they have eyes, a nose, a mouth, but they use these features, which are, as I have said, perfect, to express emotions we've never felt, so that for us to see their faces is to look upon some ancient and terrible alphabet of feeling, at once supremely important and utterly unintelligible. Such a race exists... Yet I did not encounter it there at the edge of the gardens of the House Absolute. <laughs> and that's such a cool way. Yeah, it's such an awesome, awesome, wolfish, Severian-ish kind of thing to do. What um, is this? What is the point of this description of perfect people? Are they, uh, you know, uh, hierogrammates? Uh, who else yeah, could they be? But, that's really the only candidate, right, that no. we have. Um, and what's... Really interesting, though, is that he calls them um, a race like and unlike the human. Um, Hyradules, I think, because of Yesid supposedly being a more perfect world, people often think of the Hyro, whatever they are, as sort of angelic, as Mm -hmm. higher. And that may well be true, but I think we're also eventually not supposed to think that they are actual supernatural angels. Um, but they're they're higher than us. They're maybe more developed than us, maybe more evolved than us, but but not necessarily supernaturally mm-hmm. better. Who knows? And so here's the same kind of description, right? He keeps saying they're like us, but they're perfect and they're inscrutable. Basically, they're they look perfect. They look beautiful. But at the same time, we can understand nothing about them. Now, what he's describing, of course, are the giant statues that seem to be these protectors. And I always do think of them as like a giant michelangelo david just Mm -hmm. standing there walking around who starts moving um is this sort of otherworldly yet still recognizably human beauty and it's such a cool thing that he doesn't really give us a whole lot of context for why he's bringing those things up of other than to say you know this is what these things look like um but to me what's kind of cool is that's actually how i feel about greek statuary like i recognize that they're human and they look like they're perfect, but they're from a kind of culture and a worldview that's so different from mine that just sort of like even to me, and this is very subjective, but but just the poses of Greek statues seem alien to me. Like it's like I just don't see human beings move that way or or at least I don't feel like I do. And so to me, it's kind of like just describing what what something from another culture that still looks like you is like where there's this there's this total familiarity but total alienness too mm. and i think that could work if he is talking about the hieros because they are supposed to be connected to us but somehow so much better than us that they seem actually alien which is also kind of a really strange way to think about angels like i think sometimes people would think of angelic beings as like they're just they're they're kind and they're beautiful and they're lovely but what if they're actually 
just so alien. Like what if a right. perfectly good thing is so non-human that it's almost terrifying? Like that's, that's just a weird way to think about it. Um, but also strangely appropriate. So, um, but yeah, I do think in the end, he's probably describing the actual hierogrammats or hierogrammatis. Um, it, otherwise this is just a throwaway, right? Because there's no other connection to this. Right. I, I he, think he's not describing these, time. these giant statues themselves, which don't really convey any emotion. Right. It's a good science fiction thing to describe one thing in terms of another alien thing, but then to only really get a sense of that alien thing indirectly. Like that's, Oh, that's so cool. It's just <laughs> like, I mean, what would Delaney do at that? He talks about like when he, when he does sort of linguistic analysis, he talks about how, when you read a sci-fi story, you read the thing about how the second moon rose over the, the thing. And that means that just the couple words themselves mean that you have to retranslate all your expectations and blah, blah, blah. But do that. This is like that kind of thing, but done to an extreme version where it just it asks and begs so many questions yeah. that you're almost disoriented, uh, including is there is there some direct connection between the high rows and these giant statues? And these statues right, because here they are right They're They're these alien things that are perfect. And he's saying this is what they looked like. Um, they they were they reminded him sort of after the fact he's going to mm -hmm. be reminded that oh these are like reflections of the high rows right so yeah but but it's just so disorienting like if I didn't have my sort of reaction to you know classical statues like <laughs> this I would feel like even more lost like mm, but yeah. to me it just kind of reconfirmed my sense of seeing like uh, David's technically not classical he's Renaissance whatever yeah. but but like seeing David walk around but. Yeah. Otherwise, how do you imagine these things? So do Greek yeah. statues give you kind of an uncanny valley feeling? A little bit. Yeah. 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 Um, it's it's that thing of being all so lifelike and yet something about it seems, you know, so different. And some of them are so familiar, like, but then when you actually, when I've actually like tried to think about them or, or like when I have to teach art history on occasion, it's weird. Like if I have to spend much time thinking about them, yeah, I really do get a kind of strange thing. And so when I teach, I'm all talking about the standard things about beauty and ideal human proportions and all this kind of stuff. But inside I'm usually freaked out. Yeah. <laughs> He's just on the edge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so he goes through this whole thing. Um, and like, I also think that point about perfection being strange and alien, that's a thing thematic something to hang on to mm -hmm. um, especially the more we learn about new sun being connected to some kind of evolution that's right what I, that, that's a really important thing that i i think is an idea that wolf pushes on a lot in the solar cycle right all right so what he's rushing toward is a giant living statue yeah so here's what we do get a little bit of it, it says its flesh was of white stone and its eyes had the smoothly rounded blindness we see in our own statues, like sections cut from eggshells. And there I think like, mm -hmm. you know, think about how the there's they don't the statues don't usually, you know, carve pupils or anything like that. Yeah. Although I guess originally they were painted. That's what the research seems to say. Yeah. yeah. So and I've seen reproductions and it just they look so much like that doesn't creep me out. <laughs> it's like it's because it just looks I don't know, it looks silly. But anyway, yeah, they're very um, they look very Greek and colorful. Yeah, in a lot yeah, of ways, yeah. and yeah. yeah, but of course, in the eyes, don't yeah, yeah. the way I see them don't often look quite. Yeah, it 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 sort of blows the reality in some way for yeah. me. Like that's what it does. But yeah, so he he keeps going. He says it moved slowly, like one drugged or sleeping, yet not unsteadily. It seemed sightless, yet it gave the impression of awareness, however slow. I've just paused to reread what I've written of it. And I see that I've failed utterly to convey the essence of the thing. Its spirit was that of sculpture. If some fallen angel had overheard my conversation with the green man, he might have contrived such an enigma to mock me. Uh, yeah, remember that Severian had suggested that the green man had originated as a plant. And the green man replied that, you know, it was pretty unlikely that a plant would evolve to look like a, a human. But Severian said, well, you could say the same thing about rocks, but we do have statues. Mm -hmm. And the green man was encouraged by that analogy because it meant that Severian was not someone who believed that things happen by magic. He's a materialist who understands that everything seen, no matter how strange, has a natural, not a supernatural explanation. So this is a callback to that. Yeah. And the other thing I 
feel like we should connect here to is Baldanders. Yes, yes. Who also moves slow moves and slowly. picks up on it. Yep. And who seems dumb, like he's not paying attention, and yet is very and also says seems to you know he'll speak up and say things that are either insightful or answering questions yes so there's some connection here to largeness and slowness and also some kind of evolution like i mean we're still remember these things are still kind of he described them as perfect but strange so so there's something very positive yet very disturbing about these things In its every movement, it carried the serenity and permanency of art and stone. I felt that each gesture, each position of the head and limbs and torso might be the last, or that each might be repeated interminably as the poses of the gnomons of Valeria's many-faceted dial were repeated down the curving corridors of the instance. In this case, gnomons means clocks. Uh, They are not sundials, for sure. They're in the atrium of time. Because yeah. their nomens are indicators, and they are constantly changing in a loop. Yeah. Notice, too, that I think this is the first time he talks about the corridors of time. Like, he talks about the corridors of the instance where sort of each instant is its own mm-hmm. corridor, um, which is a different way to think about corridors. Like, I, I don't know about you, but when I imagine the, the corridors of time, the way I think of it are sort of like hallways to other times. Yeah. But corridors of the instance almost makes it seem like every particular time has its own hallway, which is a, it's a different image. And I don't know, I don't know if that means anything at all, but it's just struck me that that's kind of, it was a different image in my head. Yeah. Severian has to, at the end of uh, Citadel, he has to follow the tracks in order to find his way to the atrium. So it's conceivable that if you followed a different labyrinth, you would end up in a different place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, remember that Severian's experience with the Ulan made him key to the possibility, the conviction, really, that he could have used the claw to resurrect Thecla, and his feelings were suicidal, and that's why he raced toward the giant statue. But when he got close to the statue, and he saw it for what it was, the thought, "Uh uh-oh, this thing's going to kill me. (laughs) And, (laughs) And then he realized, oh, it won't kill me. It's not an effective method of suicide. It looks scary, but it's not lethal. It wouldn't harm me even if I asked it to. Uh, Terminus Est is useless against this thing, but Severian pulls it anyway. The breeze itself seemed to pause as we stood there, the black hardly quivering, myself with sword upraised, as still almost ourselves as statues. Another tableau. Mm-hmm. As the statue approaches him, approaches them now, so Jonas must have caught up. It's three or four times the size of a human, so 18, 25 feet. Yeah. Uh, one, I want to go back one other thing. So, and the only, the thing that's cool is he says he drew his sword not because he really thought he could attack it, but he was terrified. And mm-hmm. this is sort of a, I don't know, I feel like this is a young man's worry. <laughs> but, but like, he's <laughs> like, I couldn't be terrified without acting like I was going to face it down. Right, um, yeah. That's different from the kind of like, I don't know, uncanny valley terror that I have, which is more like, I got to learn about this thing. But Severian's <laughs> still very much, I mean, yeah, he's he's a young dude. He's he's all about sort of aggression and force and right. instead of- Dominance. Like, yeah, yeah. And so that's that's the way he kind of saves face here, at least in his own mind. I mean, he's, he's, only, right. he's only doing it for himself. He's not really acting for Jonas or anybody else. Yeah. So, but yeah, then he says- It's three or four times life-size face stamped with inconceivable emotion and its limbs wrapped in terrible and perfect beauty. Severian's got his eyes on the statue, but he hears Jonas shout and the sound of a blow. He turns around to see him on the ground with men in, quote, in tall crested helmets that vanished. It's the Praetorians, and so Jonas had told Severian that he was warned about them by travelers who, quote, seemed to know what they were talking about. Mm-hmm. So Praetorians are historically the bodyguard of the Roman emperor. The adjective Praetorian is an adjective that refers to the guard, the legate, and the praetor. My sense of the word is that its etymology is you know, historically complicated. Maybe it's equivalent to municipal or provincial with the emphasis on the province that is the city of Rome itself. The 
point is that in order to become an emperor of Rome, it was almost always increasingly necessary to win the support of the Praetorian Guard in Rome. And the candidates for the office would do this by bidding up offers to the guard with bigger and bigger offers <laughs> from the capital treasury. In bad years after Nero, the bidding became more and more overt and less implied. So the adjective Praetorian became synonymous with immoral and corrupt. So the Praetorians are corrupt guards of the House Absolute. That's pretty cool. Well, we definitely know that these guys are a different class than the Ulans, right? If nothing mm -hmm. else from this strange armor that, that makes them you know, deceptive somehow too. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're in some kind of camouflage that's similar to the camouflage of the alien in the movie Predator. Yeah. Yep. Right. Oh, that's perfect. Yep. That's, that's yeah. exactly what you're saying. So we also have two different kinds of guards here. We've got like the giant statues and we've got these Praetorians. Um, and it seems like and it, the Ulan's back on the road and the Ulan's back on the road, but it does seem like a cool thing where you have the giant statues, which people will focus on. And then you got the sneaky dudes who can sneak yeah. around without you seeing them and then capture you, which is exactly what happens. Right. And in fact, Severian says that the statues would not kill him, even if he tried to get it to. And there's a sense that maybe the Praetorians can't kill him either. Mm -hmm. uh, as Severian watches them struggle with Jonas, they disappear and reappear. And then something whizzes by his ear and hits his wrist. And then suddenly he's all tied up. He's been hit by an achiko. Now, an achiko is a bolus weapon. It's weights connected by a cord. And when you throw them, the weights orbit around each other because they're connected. And when they hit something, the weights wrap the cords around the target. There are types of boas with two weights and even one with only one. But this is an achiko, which has three weights. The Inuits called it a uh, kipuyag. Hmm. That's my best shot. At. Another term is the boladora, which refers to anything having three or more weights. But I think that if you keep adding weights, you quickly get to the point where you're just having a device that flings weighted balls at people, <laughs> and it's not about tying them up. <laughs> so well, I don't have any actual experience with these things, but I had a character in a, a RPG campaign when we were playing Rollmaster for a long time instead of D&D. But that was something like that was the weapon that one of my guys would use, um, except for whatever reason, he would fail the throws all the time and what's cool about rollmaster is that every weapon had these like super elaborate critical hit charts and critical fail charts that actually had like short <laughs> couple sentence descriptions for every sort of missed roll that you did um, and it was awesome so this thing would always fail in like crazy <laughs> ways that would like catch me as i was throwing it and it would make me fall down or something like that anyway um all i would just say is they think of this as Part of me and wants to be like, I have experience of these and they are very difficult to use. But that experience. Is <laughs> so you don't recommend this as a weapon for home defense? Well, no, because I always got bad rolls. So. <laughs> so just remember that this is the most applicable word for what Severian encounters. We don't know if the weights are metal or if the cords are rope, but the concept is still the same. So if Severian is tied up, but he still seems to be on his mount. An invisible Praetorian grabs his leg and pulls him off the destrier. They put a wire noose around his neck and Severian sees the Praetorian's face over him, quote, suspended above him like it was hanging from a conjurer's thread. So Severian can only see the guy's face and nothing else because he is in camouflaged armor. You can see it gleam in the sunshine sometimes like a crystal beaker in the sun. The guy's disembodied hands are darting like brown sparrows as he roots through his saber tash. Uh, this description is really good in Wolfian. It really makes no sense until after you understand what is happening, but really only on the, on the second read. Rhetorian's face was just an impassive mask. And even now, Autark Severian doesn't really know how the armor works. He guesses, though. Yeah, he says, it was reflective, I think, burnished beyond any merely human skill, so that its own material was invisible, and only the greens and browns of the wood could be seen, twisted by the shapes of cuirass, gorget, and greaves. And then later he says, so far as I could tell, they were armored from head to foot, yet the perfect polish of the metal imparted to it a seeming softness, an almost liquid yielding that was profoundly disturbing to the eye 
and that permitted it to fade into sky and grass at a distance of a few paces. So a cuirass is a breastplate. A gorget is the armor protecting the throat. Greaves are, of course, uh, shin guards, as all our D&D playing <laughs> listeners know. Yeah, that's that's where I <laughs> for the first time. Yeah. Yeah, and Severian is shouting, I'm a member of the guild, and they don't care. The Praetorian takes all his money, so his accounts are back down to zero again. This is typical in any adventure story. They pile up big reservoirs of cash, and then it goes away. But in Severian's case, he'll always have enough money when money would do him some good. And he sees that they leave everything that's not money in the saber tash, which includes the brown book, uh, his half a whetstone, remember the green man got the other half, his oil and flannel. We know Terminus Est will be okay. There's other stuff too that he doesn't detail. The government strategy with the Ulans on the roads and the Praetorians on the house absolute ground seems to be kind of the same as letting vicious dogs roam around a junkyard at night. You don't tell them what to do. They're expected to attack anyone they encounter who doesn't belong there. Mm -hmm. Their motivations in doing their job is not different from bandits or pirates, except that they are limited by very specific rules. They are different from bandits in the way that privateers are different from pirates. Privateers get letters of mark to attack ships under very specific conditions. And in fact, that used to be the primary weapon governments would employ against pirates. Did you know there, uh, that according to the U.S. Constitution, in addition to the power to declare war, Congress has the authority to issue letters of mark and other reprisals? Hmm. I did not. Yeah. If theoretically, Congress could give private actors the authority to go after ransomware hackers in other countries. They could do hmm. that if they wanted. And that would be what the government is doing to the Praetorians and Ulans. Then the Praetorian deftly removes the Accio cords and, as far as Severian can tell, tucks them into the armhole of his armor. And that's when he gets a look at what he was ensnared with. Then the Praetorian forces him to his feet and with the noose. And Severian has an interesting attitude here that I was complying and I didn't have to. I could have refused to get up and forced him to strangle me or forced him to get his friends to carry me. Yeah, yeah. And this is interesting. Also a weird time. Well, maybe not too weird, but a little bit of a weird time to bring it up. So he says, My captor now lifted the wire noose until I stood. I was conscious, as I have been on several similar occasions, that we were in some sense playing a game. We were pretending that I was totally in his power, when in fact I might have refused to rise until he had either strangled me or called over some of his comrades to carry me. I could have done several other things as well, seized the wire, tried to wrest it from him, struck him in the face. I might have escaped, been killed, been rendered unconscious, or plunged into agony, but I could not actually be forced to do as I did. At least I knew it was a game, and I smiled as he sheathed Terminus Est and led me to where Jonas stood. I mean, yeah, Severian, you're complying, but what is the really the point in resisting? I, I guess this is maybe some reflection on free will and the requirements of necessity or predestination. Yeah, that's precisely it, I think, is that at this point, whether true or not, Severian is saying even when you someone thinks they're in you're in their power, you still have choices, right? It's even the it, it's the old parents thing of like, yes, you can you can do whatever you want, but you will still have the consequences. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but given everything else, especially as we get a sense of the larger context of which things are going on, this is a troubling thing to say because that's the real question. I think later on of well, is Severian kind of on an adventure with Rails here where other people are manipulating him and controlling him, or is he aware of those and still choosing to do it? Or is he literally just being, you know, the one doing his own thing here? Right. Um, and, and that's the question that's come up many, many times. And that I feel like from the beginning with the Undine in the water with Jaterna in the very first chapter, where we find out that somebody is watching over him, there's definitely a huge level of irony over Severian saying this, because mm -hmm. it's kind of like, it makes you think, well, all the other times when you've been acting 
how much of that is really you and how much of that is you making choices because of the circumstances that you're right. in. Um, and it, I mean, it's a fair point that he's like, but I think also your point about, you know, well, what else are you going to do? Uh, <laughs> like that's actually important here too, because there still can be a sense in which you might have the illusion of freedom, but really all the circumstances around you for all intents and purposes, you're under their control. Right. My take on this is that Severian is right on a sort of immediate literal level, but probably wrong in all the ways that matter. <laughs> that, that, like he's he's got a noose around him, and whether it's the Megatherians or the Autark Project or or First Severian or whatever, all those things are working on him, and there's no easy way to tell what's literally his choice. Um, and so it is there is a game being played yeah. but we're we're just not really sure yet what the rules are and when you don't know the rules of a game that makes it really hard to know whether or not you're the one making decisions yeah yeah i think that that idea of asynchronous knowledge is significant in the book and it's significant here severian doesn't really know that these praetorians won't cut him loose mm -hmm. in just a little bit he doesn't know that they will bring him by with this wire to his acting troops so he'll be reunited with Dorcas or whatever. He doesn't know. Yeah, yeah. But the only thing I can think of for this purpose of this passage, really in a practical sense, is to address potential thoughts in the minds of the reader. Couldn't Severian have used his torture skills to escape? It's just a wire noose around his neck. His hands are free. So Severian is telling us, yeah, I know I didn't have to comply. But for all the complicated reasons you can think of yourself, I chose to comply and probably anyone else would too. And it's also weird because you're like, well, he's supposed to go to the autarch's house. So if he just starts killing the guards over and over and he mm -hmm. already killed <laughs> and happily resurrected one, one Ulan, one guard, I mean, why would he, why would he do that? You know, yeah, when, why would he be expected to be greeted as right. anything but an enemy? Right. 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 So it, it still strikes me as just a moment where, where, Severian is insisting on, you know, agency or knowing what he's doing or knowing what's going on when in truth, you know, no, there's, there's no way just even in the very basics of, you know, you don't even really know where you're supposed to meet this person. Um, but he's still very cocksure. I yeah. And Severian, I think is right that given the weapons and practices they use, the Praetorians are prohibited from deliberately killing anyone they meet. They're supposed to only capture them. Mm-hmm. Um, also, we're going to get a scene like this in Dr. Talos's play, but it's definitely not this scene. But it depicts the same scenario with a different captured vic victim, two Praetorians, and someone on House Absolute Grounds. Yep. And he does go on to sort of admit this, right? Or like he, There's a, a little paragraph where he says, uh, In silence, two Praetorians, four fluttering sparrows, as it seemed. In other words, he couldn't see their armor. He could just see the things that were there. Caught our destriers and led them away. How like us those animals were, walking patiently they knew not where, their massive heads following thin strips of leather. Right, yeah. Nine-tenths of life, so it seems to me, consists of these surrenders. Um, which is a kind of cool way to put it because surrender is sort of like different from being actually forced to do something. It's, yeah. it's, it's allowing yourself to go with someone else's. Exactly. Yeah. Power. There's, free, that, there's free will in giving up your yeah, agency. Yeah. And especially, I mean, that's, I mean, that's how, if you're talking about sort of a re religious awareness, that sort of not resignation really, but acceptance of, you know, whatever, whatever, call it God's plan or predestination or whatever, you know, that's seen as a good thing. And so it's kind of cool where in this passage, you've got sort of all these different ways of thinking about free will and submission and power and, and being controlled by things that there are all kinds of complicated ways you can choose to look at it. Yeah. And Jonas says, we've done no harm. Return my friend's sword and give us back our animals and we will go. And, you know, well, that was worth a shot anyway. <laughs> uh, the picture of the two Praetorians here with only their hands visible, looking like four fluttering sparrows, that's good. And Severian tells us, without saying it flatly, that there are two Praetorians by saying, you know, four fluttering sparrows. Yeah. But he does go on, right? He does say there's a little bit more. Um, 
so now they're they're following too, just like the horses. It says, we were made to go with our captors out of the wood and onto a rolling meadow that soon became a lawn. The statue walked after us, and others of his kind joined him until there were a dozen or more, all huge, all different, and all beautiful. A dozen giant statue sentries? <laughs> that, that seems unnecessary, unless the statues are just programmed to move toward anyone not in Praetorian armor. And the Praetorians don't push them forward under guard. They lead them. They lead Jonas and Severian by their tethers. So, you know, there's some real meaning, I guess, to Severian's description of their compliance. Yeah. And I don't want to know if I want to push this too hard, but the fact that he says a dozen, we know the 12 apostles, Mm, but, but the point there is also like the reason why I think thinking of that as an apostle's illusion might be appropriate is because of leading and following Mm -hmm. and he talks about these statues are following him but it's it's kind of a question like are you simply a follower of a you know leader or charismatic leader or religious leader or are you choosing to really do something and surrender in that case is a good thing it's it's not a bad thing to give up your power and so we had this little tableau of people who seem to be in power leading other people who may be really still on their own power or maybe not but but it just is a cool way to sort of bring up all these questions of you know who's guiding who yeah who's who's really doing it in the end and and, you know i i mentioned that it's probable that the statues are following just anybody who's not a praetorian but maybe not maybe they know who severian is maybe they are following severian for a reason it could be yeah Yeah, they're just so inscrutable we just we literally literally don't know anything yeah yeah Uh, Severian and Jonas are not permitted to talk. When Severian tries to ask Jonas who these guards are, he is, quote, nearly throttled for my pains. They walk about 30 minutes on the lawn. He calls it a sward. And then they come to a grove, an orchard of flowering plums. When they do, quote, at once the crested helms and flaring pauldrons danced with pink and white. Nice image. Uh, Pauldrons are shoulder guards in armor. Yeah, which is another cool thing where it's like, you know, armor, things of war become flowers and become birds and mm-hmm. and definitely look different than they actually are. It's also right. one thing to remember, these are also another kind of mirror in a sense, right? It's like Yeah. It's, it's, oh yeah, very much. Reflections and and in this case reflection is showing you something different. It's hiding something, which is different from the mirrors as being maybe showing you the truth about yourself right. or something. Exactly. Yeah. Then they move onto a curvy path, or maybe it's a circular path. Severian says curved and curved again. So, yeah, it could be like a little spiral for all Uh I know. They get to the point where they can see the end of the grove, and then the Praetorians shove Severian and Jonas back to a halt. And this is where it's obvious to me that Severian and Jonas are being led and not driven forward. The statues stop too. Severian writes... One of the soldiers warned them off with what seemed to me a wordless cry. Uh, But it's not clear to me if he's saying that they stopped because of the wordless cry or if the statues walked away at his signal. Yeah. My inclination is the latter. Yeah. And that wordless cry is also another thing where it could be in a different language. Right. I mean, he's because he's already mentioned how Jonas yelled at him something he couldn't understand. And, right. And we wondered whether that was you know, Korean or, or whatever other language that he might speak. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it just, it just adds to me, it just adds to the strangeness of these statue creatures. Exactly. And Severian looks through the edge of the grove and sees a garden path much wider and more magnificent than the one they've been on. It's paved with white stone and there are marble balustrades bordering it on either side. Apparently there are various lawns visible too. Remember the balustrades are ornamental railings. There's a lot of traffic on this road. Most walking, but some riding animals. Someone is leading quote, a shaggy arctother, a giant bear. Someone else is riding on the neck of a green ground sloth, greener than the grass of the lawns. Groups of people are just, they just keep coming. Yeah, and that white stone road, same as the sort mm-hmm. of white bone path that we saw in the very first chapter. Yes. Yeah. So something about these white roads. Wolf loves white roads as being 
somehow significant. Yeah, and obviously <laughs> on, a, on a Hamlet's mi- right, and on a Hamlet's Mill uh, level, I always mm-hmm. see that as the Milky Way. Mm-hmm. Among the groups of people in the traffic passing by as they watch it is Baldanders. <laughs> and then he sees Dr. Talos at the front of his group with his chest thrown out and his head well back. And then he sees Dorcas behind him, more than ever like a forlorn child wandered from some higher sphere, he says. <laughs> of course, I think there's some appropriateness to that description. Uh, and then behind those two is Jolenta, quote, fluttering with veils and sparkling with bijoux under her parasol, riding side saddle on a miniature Jeanette. A Jeanette is a female donkey, so she must have finally spent her own money so that she wouldn't have to walk. <laughs> sparkling with bijoux under her parasol. Bijoux are jewels and ornaments. Anything dainty or small, a bijoux spelled with an X is not a Z, is plural for bijou. And behind them all, carrying and pulling all the company's property is bald anders. Right. So seeing these guys too, by the way, at just the right moment, right? That, mm-hmm. That's a that's lucky. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're but if you're in the still thinking about, you know, chance or control or, you know, this definitely feels like something is pulling some strings somewhere yes. on Severian to get to see this. Yep. Yeah, definitely. So, so yeah, he watches them go by, um, but he's, he's not allowed to say anything. Um, he says, it was painful for me to see them pass without being able to call out. It must have been torment for Jonas. When Jolenta was nearly opposite us, she turned her head. To me at that moment, it seemed she must have winded or sensed his desire, as among the mountains, certain unclean spirits are said to be attracted by the odor of meat that's been cast <laughs> upon a fire for them. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Um, <laughs> but it but it's a cool. I mean, it, it also heightens Jonas's sort of thing. It's like you know, there's something not just lusty about this. When you have spirits that are attracted to meat. It's um, yeah. It's it's a yeah. to me, it's a metaphor that or a comparison that that. Yeah, it makes Jonas's love seem really weird. Anyway, and it's um, also an association with the, in the play with Jahi, who oh, that's right. that's Jolenta right. is going to uh, portray. That's right. I'd forgotten about that, but yeah, that's at my, hold on. I'm gonna make a note for that here. <laughs> As I'm working on the play, I'm trying to find every little connection. Okay, um, he says, no doubt it was really only the flowering trees among which we stood that caught her attention. I heard the inhalation of Jonas's breath. But the first syllable of her name was cut short by the thud of the blow that followed, and he pitched at my feet. When I recall that scene now, the rattle of his metal hand on the gravel of the path is as vivid as the perfume of the plum blossoms. All right, so the traffic clears. I suppose Talos's troop was just one of a whole array of performers that's being ushered in. I don't know how they got in without being assaulted by the Praetorians. It seems the very end's ham-fisted suicide attempt has just caused them a lot of extra trouble. <laughs> and then the Praetorians pick up Jonas and carry him. Severian notices that it seems pretty easy for them. And at the time he attributes it to their great strength, or maybe their armor has you know strength components. But later he'll learn that Jonas is not just older than he thought, but he's significantly lighter. Uh, they cross the road and they cross through a quote, hedge of roses higher than a man covered with immense white blossoms and filled with nesting birds. And that's just cool. It makes me think a little bit of Alice in Wonderland, of mm-hmm. the Queen's yeah. roses, but but here they're huge. They're they're taller than everyone. So yeah, this whole thing just forest. reeks of Lewis Carroll. Yeah, yeah. He says, Beyond it lay the gardens proper. If I should try to describe them, I should seem only to have borrowed the mad, stammering eloquence of Heather. Every hill and tree and flower seem to have been arranged by some master intelligence, which I have since learned, is that of Father Inire, to form a breathtaking vision. The observer feels that he's at the center, that everything he sees has been directed toward the point at which he stands. But after he's walked a hundred paces or a league, he finds himself at the center still, and every vision seems to convey some incommunicable truth, like one of the unutterable insights granted Aramites. Uh, Craig, on the Patreon site, we posted an episode where we went through Jorge Luis Borges' story, Talan Ukbar, Tertius Orbis. And this is essentially the geography of the Talanese. <laughs> they, they're strict Barclian idealists. They do not believe that illusions of perspective 
where things far away look smaller, where railroad tracks seem to converge in the distance. They don't believe this is an illusion. They believe things actually are smaller the farther away. And you know, maybe even farther away doesn't really mean anything. The farther they are away from you and that the rail tracks do converge in the distance. And they don't believe that things being farther away or in the distance is an actual illusion. This garden accomplishes that in that it makes you constantly feel like you are in the designed center of the garden. And all this is accomplished by that master florist and botanical artist, Father Aneri. <laughs> He's the master gardener of the botanic gardens and the guy who installed the Averns to control manatee infestations. And here at House Absolute, he does the same thing. Gardening seems to be a major priority of the Commonwealth <laughs> state, which is surprising, given all the laws they have to keep people on the grass and off the paths. <laughs> Good point. Um yeah, but I just also like how he says it here. He's like, you know, it looked as if as if some master had designed every aspect of it, which the way he says it is almost like, but of course no one could do it that well. But then he's like, oh, and his name, by the way, it was Father Neri. That's <laughs> yeah, just it's funny. It's funny. But yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Um, and he says, he goes on, he says, so beautiful were these gardens that we'd been in them for some time before I realized that no towers were lifted above them, only the birds and the clouds. And beyond them, the old sun and the pale stars rose higher than their treetops. We might have been wandering through some divine wilderness. Then we reached the crest of a wave of land, more lovely than any cobalt wave of Eroberus's. And with breathtaking suddenness, a pit opened at our feet. Okay, this is part of how Aniri accomplishes the feeling that you're always in the center of the garden. You can never see the end of it. It's surrounded by a hill of lawn instead of a fence or hedge, a hill that you can't see until you're right up on it. And the other side of the hill is a grotto where you can enter the house absolute if you know where to walk to. I've called it a pit, but it was not at all like the dark abyss usually associated with that word. Rather, it was a grotto filled with fountains and night flowers and dotted with people more brilliant than any flowers, people who loitered beside its waters and gossiped among its shades. At once, as though a wall had collapsed to let light into a tomb, many of the memories of the House Absolute, mined by absorption now from the life of Thecla, coalesced. I understood something that had been implicit in the Doctor's play and in many of the stories Thecla had told me as well, though she'd never mentioned it directly. The whole of this great palace lay underground, or rather its roofs and walls were heaped with soil planted and landscaped, so that we'd been walking all this time over the seat of the Autarch's power, which I had thought still some distance away. They don't go down to that grotto, which is probably where Talos and company have gone. There are a lot of other grottos, entrances to the house absolute that they pass yeah. as well. And one thing that strikes me as I read this, thinking again about like power and not knowing sort of who's controlling who, but this idea that you can just be wandering out in a field and things can be beautiful and nice, but underneath it is the castle of the king who or, or whatever who mm -hmm. controls everything that still fits too because it's kind of like you know the the idea that the autarch's power reaches everywhere or or in area or someone is behind everything is kind of even in this where it's like yeah you're already in my palace you don't realize it right but you're already here um, under my sway yeah exactly yeah and if i were building a house and had unlimited funds that I would definitely build my house underneath the hill. So, <laughs> um, But he keeps describing it, though. So he says, At last, however, we came upon one far more grim, though no less beautiful. The stair by which we entered it had been carved to resemble a natural formation of dark rock, irregular and sometimes treacherous. Water dripped from above, and ferns and dark ivy grew in the upper parts of this artificial cavern, where a little sunlight still found its way. In the lower regions, a thousand steps down, the walls were studded with blind fungi. Some of these were luminous. Some strewed the air with strange, musty odors. Some suggested fantastic phallic fetishes. <laughs> blind fungi? Uh, some resembling fantastic phallic fetishes? I say, Craig, maybe some resembled Santa Claus, right? <laughs> Probably so. It's got to be the, the Amanita muscaria. <laughs> yes. But yeah, it's a blind fungi is just, it's just a, such a cool thing because right, you know, all, yeah. all fungi are blind, but to insist on it. 
right? Yeah. <laughs> Especially blind. Severian describes this place as a dark garden. It's just like the garden above, but this one is of fungi instead of roses. And in the center of it all, there are a set of gongs. They're held up with scaffolding and green with verdigris. Verdigris is the green color that forms on copper, brass, and bronze when it's been exposed to seawater for a long time. You've probably seen it on bronze statues. So to Severian, these look like wind chimes, and that's what they are. Praetorians open a heavy door made of bronze and worm-scarred wood in the one of the dark stone walls. A draft blows out the, of the doorway, and the gongs sway and chime, just like the bells on the doorway of the rag shop when Severian entered it. And in fact, cosmologically, I say we are in the exact same place, the Great Rift, looking into the center of the Milky Way galaxy, Severian says their chiming seemed the purposeful composition of some musician whose thoughts are now in exile here. <laughs> yeah. In looking up at the gongs, which the Praetorians did not prevent me from doing, I saw the statues, 40 at least, who'd followed us all the way across the gardens. They now rimmed the pit, motionless at last, and looked down on us like a frieze of cenotaphs. So he, he weighed, the Praetorian weighed them off, but really they still follow. Yeah. And still watch. What's with those statues? I don't they, know. And, <laughs> and it is a good question. Like I, when you mentioned like he waved them away, but they still do their thing that, yeah, I wonder if that's supposed to be that they weren't doing what they were supposed to. Like they're following Severian for some reason, even though mm -hmm. they're supposed to be out guarding the edge of, the house absolute um yeah i don't know but it's reading at this time that struck me as maybe intentional like wolf was trying to get that sense yeah. across that maybe they weren't doing what the praetorians wanted and were acting a little weird even even for them but so much is so weird here it's hard to know like yeah well they seem far more important to this chapter than yeah. was obvious to me before or is clear to me why it's going on they show up in dr talos's play i don't know they, they make me paranoid as a reader. <laughs> With good reason. <laughs> Severian expects them to be taken to individual cells like they have at the Manichin. But when they go through the doors, they enter a big, open, carpeted room with more doors on the other side. Well, if you've been to Khans, you know how this is. <laughs> Severian sees Hastari guarding the doors across the room. Hastari carry Hasta in the Latin word for spear or lance, it means spearmen. But these soldiers are described as carrying flaming spears. So this is future technology. At the Praetorian's command, the Hastari opened the doors to a, quote, vast shadowy bare room with a low ceiling. Now, this is a drop ceiling, we'll discover, like you see in office buildings. This lets cabling and central heating and cooling infrastructure be easily installed and service throughout a large room. They have standard 20th century office architecture in the distant <laughs> future. Just to make this chapter even weirder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there are several dozen men and women in the room, a few children. Most are in single groups, but there are couples standing around too. And you can see whole families stationed in the alcoves, probably cubicles. I guess, you know, along the wall. And they have rags and such strung up for privacy. They push Severian into the room and toss Jonas into it. Severian rushes to catch him and prevents him from getting too hurt. And then the door slams shut. We are in the antechamber of the chapter title. And that's it. Like That's, that's all. <laughs> that's yeah, where we end. So yeah, so not a whole lot happens, but actually after having talked about it, I feel more and more like that, that passage about control really is kind of important important like is is if there's a sense or just a mood that wolf's trying to push here it's that idea of not knowing what's really in control and severian mm -hmm. having to kind of finally recognize that and all these things happening that just in the mechanics of being a prisoner he doesn't really have control but then also these statues doing the statues thing, yeah that he doesn't really have control over that but they're, and there's still suggestions that somebody is in charge whether it's father Anire or whether it's you know, the autark because of the house absolute being everywhere underneath this. 
Yeah, one of the things we we didn't say was the cenotaph, which he describes the the statues ringing the pit as a frieze of cenotaphs. And a cenotaph is like a statue that's supposed to commemorate someone who's actually buried somewhere else. Right, yeah. Which is such a weird idea that here are these statues standing up there commemorating something. And they're kind of in a grave. They're in a pit under the ground. um, And you have these things, but something else is buried there or so it's it's like they're they're really commemorating something that's somewhere else so there's all this suggestion of severian not being in control or the real thing being somewhere else or or the the real power not coming from where you'd suspect it all this weird stuff as you get closer to the house absolute and it could just be getting you ready to to finally see how the inner workings of the commonwealth work and how sort of strange and indirect everything is um, or it could also have some bigger meaning towards severian's situation but right. I, reading it this time i feel like that whole thing about power control surrender pretending to be under someone's control or not like it's it, everything in here is sort of bringing those issues up over and over again right and then back to that last, the, the opening image of the perfect race that looks human, but is inscrutable like that. And somehow tied uh, to those statues in a, in a way. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of the feeling you get of how the real things in control maybe are here. Like the real power is kind of inscrutable at this point. Right. You don't know, like, even though he says he mentions father and Harry made this garden and you're like, but what, why, like what, <laughs> for what purpose? Um, and that's kind of how you feel. He loves to garden. Everything he does has a garden theme. Yeah. I, I, honestly, I hadn't quite made that connection before. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, really cool. Just so sort of imagistic and impressionist of a, of a chapter. Um, but no, so if, if we are going to fish for particular questions and comments this time, it's the statues. Yeah, it's got to be those statues. I yep. want to hear what you think about those statues. Yep. I want to hear you reach out to us with your ideas and other comments about what the heck is the statues, which seem to be very important. There's a passage that opens this chapter that doesn't seem to refer to the chapter. It specifically says it doesn't refer to the statues, but is obviously connected because they introduce the statues. So I want to hear, you know, what your thoughts. Yeah. I want to hear your corrections and complaints. Yeah. So just bring them to us on the Facebook group, the subreddit, the Twitter, email, or the Patreon site. And you can find out how to do all that on the show notes. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts and tell your wolf reading friends and... Until you hear from us next, may the Moira favor you. And may the doors of the antechamber not shut on you. <laughs> Stay away from the Rhetorians. Those travelers knew what they were talking about. Stay out of pits and holes in the ground. That's always good advice. Yeah, you don't need to read the book to know that. And offices. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> don't live in your cubicles. I guess it doesn't matter. Um, you probably didn't even recognize it, but my mic wasn't on. <laughs> I was thinking, oh, no, he can't hear me. But then I realized, oh, no, he 
Oh, he obviously could. <laughs> it, oh no, I guess I guess it was just I didn't even pay attention to quality. I was just yeah. going. So well, okay, that's even, okay. I think we'll be okay. I think yeah, I think we're fine. Obviously, um, we are fine. We are what we are. So yep. So it'd be good. Um, Obviously, waiting rooms. Like I don't know. I, I, I something. How to, how to decrease the truth doctors' is, wait times? Most of these things just come out out, out of, right out of my fingers. I'll just start. Oh no, I get it. Next thing I know, I get it. <laughs>